So although we're a little bit different, we will have some plants and animals for people <laughs> as well. Uh, and before I start, I do just want to thank all the folks at Emma Kwan for their support over the years. Um, I'd also like to note that this project is a collaboration with the Illinois State Museum and Dixon Mounds Museum. And the co-PI on this project is Dr. Michael Connor, uh, who's now retired from Dixon Mounds. Uh, and of course, the work wouldn't have been possible at all had I not had um, 10 years worth of field school students, graduate students, um, and, and volunteers. Um, so that was, that was great. Um, it's also important um, to recognize that the archaeology that we're discussing today is part of the history and cultural heritage of today's Native American people whose ancestors occupied this really incredible landscape. So like I said, this is, uh, we started the field work in 2008. So we had 10 field seasons. Um, the last few years, we've been um, back in the lab doing sort of the preliminary round of major analyses. And we're starting um, to put out some publications and dissertations um, from that work now. And so this is where I'm going with the talk and uh, I have a lot to cover, so um, hang on. <laughs> all right, you all know where the Amaquan Preserve is, but you might not realize um, that the Morton Village site is where it is, up at the northern end, um, right at the top of the hill. Um, and it's also important to um, see the relationship of the Morton site mark there with Norris Farms uh, 36. Uh, on the right hand side of your screen, um, that shows the prior work that was done before our project, mostly by Dixon, uh, Dixon Mounds folks. Um, just so you can get an idea of sort of the spatial, um, how spatially restricted that work was, and uh, you'll see um, in a few minutes here, um, that ours covered the, the site um, much more, and we've learned some new things about the site. All right, it's important um, for background kinds of information that you're aware of Norris Farms 36, the cemetery that's associated with the village. Uh, and this is really what drew me um, to the site and let me convince Michael Connor that we should do the project. Um, at Norris Farms, you have the largest Oneota skeletal population that exists. Um, it's important for that reason alone, but it's also important because it's one of two very clear examples of pre-Columbian um, indigenous violence uh, and sort of low scale um, warfare. Um, it speaks very clearly to those um, issues in archeology. span um, I just note um, that it is an Oneota cemetery but it has very clear Mississippian influences within that cemetery and um, in how the cemetery um, was presented on the landscape and also um, the kinds of grave goods and so on that were found. Just a word about the two groups um, that we now um, are convinced live together at the site, Oneota and Mississippians. So two different cultural groups coming together we know that a migration occurred about AD uh, 1300, and the area was pretty much abandoned by AD 1400. Um, certainly the site was. Um, there is not very much Oneota, so it wasn't a huge influx of people. Um, we only really know about um, five, maybe six sites um, in the area um, that belong to this cultural tradition, and that's the little green map that you're seeing there. And what's not on that slide is all of the Mississippian sites um, that were also in the area. Um, very early on, people were talking about like in the 1930s, um, when the University of Chicago folks were down here, um, they were talking about um, a, an admixture of these cultures, probably some cohabitation. You know, all of that seemed very likely um, when we started doing our work. Um, and again, on the right-hand side, this is the work from the 80s uh, that Dixon Mounds um, did at the site, the, the non-cemetery. This is the stuff up in, 
in the village associated with the utilities, right of ways, and some other construction that went on. So they had already documented some houses, the ones in red, sort of the, the bigger squares. Um, the ones in red are, are Oneota, and the ones in blue are Mississippian. So they had um, evidence of both of them at the time, but again, a sort of a limited um, spatial representation across the village. And um, that, of course, re, you know, if you do less work, you're going to have, have less data. So the interpretations that were made were made on that um, smaller sample. So in a nutshell, um, we knew that the migration occurred. We knew that there was a great deal of Mississippian influence there. Uh, we're talking about a limited number of sites. Um, the violence is extremely clear. There's no question about it. Um, probably some social stress as well. Um, that shows up in the skeletal um, analysis. Um, at Morton, we had a small sample of houses and most of those were Oneota. Um, and so this small um, subsistence data sample plus the evidence for stress and violence in the cemetery, um, one of the ideas that that combination led to was this idea that um, lifeways how people made their living on the landscape, the plants and animals um, that they selected, that they hunted, they fished, they gathered, all of those things would have been circumscribed or it would have limited them in the area that areas that they were seeking out. Further away from the village, you're more likely to be attacked, was the idea. So why did we decide to go there? What did we wanna know? Um, I've worked on Oneota sites further to the north where they're more common and I've always um, been fascinated with this site. What is the social context for that violence that we see? What's the social context in the village? What was life like? Why would the Oneota even be there <laughs> or stay for any amount of time? So who was at the site? How did the Oneota fit into the Mississippian world or did they? Um, those major questions led us to a, a set of sort of secondary questions um, that you can see there. Um, so were they co-occupants? If so, what's the nature of that? What's the evidence for social stress? Um, what does the mixing in material culture mean? Uh, those sorts of, of questions are what we're trying to answer. All right, so what we found, I have to move this so I can see better. Um, our plan was to do test excavations across the site to get a, a more, um, a fuller or broader picture of the site, and, and we did that. We then brought in um, a specialist, Dr. Tim Horsley, to do some remote sensing for us. Um, and I'm going to show you the, the results of that in just a moment. Um, and we wanted to do some sampling based on that. We sampled domestic structures across the site. Um, to determine building techniques because those two groups, Oneota and Mississippian, built different kinds of houses. And you can see that archaeologically. Um, so at the end of our field work, including the, the earlier work, there's now been 48 total um, structures that have been um, at least um, investigated. They have not all been totally excavated, um, but we have good data on their architecture. Um, we wanted to sample pit features to really extend the faunal and floral evidence um, that we had. Pit features are where a lot of garbage was disposed of, and so archaeologists love garbage because it gives us the plants and animals that people um, ate and used in other ways. Um, and also that's where your broken uh, dishes go um, and other kinds of material culture. And so we ended up um, including, again, the, the earlier work, there's been 338 of those pit features investigated. We've also augmented um, the existing radiocarbon dates with a whole suite of AMS dates on um, short-lived species to, to help narrow the range that we're looking at. Um, some adjustments to the plan as we went along, uh, we found some ritual structures that we didn't necessarily expect. Um, and we decided um, towards the end that we had time to fully excavate a burn structure, um, one that had been burned down, um, probably not on purpose. <laughs> and 
uh, we wanted to see um, how that compared to the other structures as well. All right, so this is what um, one of the first passes of our um, remote survey looked like. This is um, magnetometer output. In case you've never seen this before, you can, you can see that it's not um, all that clear. Um, there's a lot of interpretation that has to go on. Um, this little um, blowout here, these squares, those are actually structures. Um, most of these are probably domestic structures. And this is what our interpretation looks like after we clean that data up. So this is the distribution um, across the site of the structures that we're fairly confident are structures. And we like to ground proof um, this sort of, of data because it is hard to, hard to interpret sometimes. And um, we found that it's pretty much been spot on. You can't get to the level of detail to tell um, the different types of architecture apart, but you can identify um, where structures are usually. And this is what they look like. Um, as you as you excavate them. The two different types of structures are called single post. That's the kind of structures that Oneota build. Um, here's a post line of single posts. Um, and here's a wall trench. Um, the trench was dug and then the post set into that. Uh, you don't usually find them together like this, um, but we do have several um, that show up like this um, in the main part of the village. Um, and our interpretation is that it's an Oneota um, rebuilding um, or a rebuilding using the Oneota um, architectural technique. Here's um, a photo of that burned structure that we fully excavated, um, which you're looking at over, where's my pointer? Over in this area, the, the black log looking things, those are actual timbers. Um, probably from, I'm guessing, from sidewalls um, and not the roof because they're a little bit large. Um, so a lot of that across the whole area that we um, had to excavate. And underneath that, we found the floor of the structure and all of the, the stuff that um, was in that house um, as it burned down, which included um, both Oneota and Mississippian whole pots sitting on the floor. Um, it also included some other um, valuable items that people had stashed sort of over in the corner in a little cash pit, and as well as a hearth and, and the materials that you would find around that. Here's just a, a couple of slides to show you that we really can tell the difference between Mississippian and Oneota pottery, um, which is one of our main um, modes of being able to sort of distinguish these two groups um, at the site. So, oh, sorry, this one is Mississippian. Um, they have cord marked, um, cord marking on the exterior of some of their larger pots. They also do um, some incising. It's a different decorating techniques, different from what we find with the Oneota who have a very kind of stylized Oneota here looks like Oneota in other places. All right, and this is our, um, just an example of one of our um, rich structures, quite different than a domestic household. Um, this one is unique. We're not aware of any other examples anywhere, um, Mississippian or Oneota, um, that has this sort of, of ritual structure. And this is important uh, for some reasons I'll talk about in a, in a couple minutes. Um, but this, this structure was unique in its architecture um, around the outside, you see a, an outer, um, uh, uh, excuse me, a bench area defined here. That was sort of a, a raised area. Um, and then there was a steep wall down to the floor where well, the wall wasn't very tall, <laughs> maybe like a foot, foot and a half. Um, but that wall was in essence sort of plastered um, with clay, which became very hard. Um, we're not sure if it was intentionally hardened with fire or um, if it just dried um, extremely well. But within this, um, there's no sign that it was like a domestic kind of structure. Um, 
I could probably talk for hours just on this, so I'm not going to. But as one example of sort of the, the ritual evidence that we found um, within it, up on top of that bench, um, we found this, which is a collapsed Oneota pot. And this little figurine, um, which is the one pictured here, was found within that pot. Um, he's not very big, um, and we're calling it an owl man figurine. Um, if you go to the museum, you can find other um, examples of this sort of a face with the beak. Um, so a bird of some kind, I think probably um, they're using some Mississippian symbolism within this predominantly Oneota kind of context. And I say that based on all of the other pottery that we found um, within this building. Okay, <clears throat> I don't, I'm not going to read this whole slide to you. Um, but one of our first questions, what we felt was really important to do was to clearly demonstrate that the Oneota and Mississippian were you know, co-residing at this site. Um, that wouldn't have necessarily been necessary for the Oneota to have, have some cultural influence from other people in the area. Um, and so we thought it was really important to sort of tease that out. And here are six reasons <laughs> that that we're using. And they're based, um, well, almost all of them are based on um, architecture and, um, and the stylized kind of, of pottery that we use um, to distinguish the two groups. Um, and the fact that we're finding both Oneota and Mississippian pottery um, within most contexts. Um, so those are our six reasons. And um, from there, we're arguing that this is a solid case of them cohabitating. And so the next step in all of this then is to understand what that means, right? So um, the way that we're theorizing sort of this cohabitation and the nature of the community and how they're dealing with this sort of stress and, and why um, is this idea of coalescence which um, archaeologists in different parts of, of North America and the world are, are using this idea of coalescence or the process of how people come together, usually after a migration, um, and the reshaping of social, political, ideological, um, uh, and economics um, of the community. So when you bring two groups together, things just can't stay the same, basically but there's a lot of room for variation in there. So how much cultural diversity is maintained or do the newcomers want to completely fit in um, and take on all of the, all of the outward signs of, of being part of their new community? Um, how do those sociopolitical structures change? What social negotiations take place? Um, and also important to this idea is that we expect in these situations that creative new ways of doing things um, will happen as people see you know, how, how other people deal with things, um, particularly on a brand new landscape. So for our project, we're looking at coalescence through um, use of space at the site. You know, are there neighborhoods? Are there areas where it's just Oneona, just Mississippian? Um, <clears throat> excuse me, then we have the evidence of houses that, you know, have a little of both. What does that mean? Is it simple reuse? Are people adopting other architectural um, kinds of methods? Um, we have to consider those things. Um, domestic households, how groups are arranging themselves. Um, food ways is an important one and one that um, you'll see that our Work that's ongoing focuses a lot on food ways and cuisine, um, how the groups are negotiating, you know, their togetherness or how they're apart by using um, their traditional or non-traditional new food habits. And ritual is also important. Okay, so some of the, the new work, um, Dr. Kelsey Nordeen um, recently defended her dissertation um, and her work was on paleoethnobotanical analysis. She did a, um, a three-part 
um, a three article kind of dissertation. So she looked at um, basically food ways, what are the botanical remains telling us about what kinds of, of plants people used. Um, and I thought um, some of you um, in the natural sciences might like to see some of her results. So these are me pulling out her data. These are not um, from the dissertation, but I did steal her nice pictures. Um, so in, in addition to the dietary stuff, she looked at feasting um, from the context that Terry Martin is going to talk about um, right after me, uh, which was sort of interesting because as Terry will tell you, there was a ton of um, faunal remains, but the, um, the floral remains, very little, almost nothing, <laughs> except up in um, the top layer um, of the feature where there is an interesting deposit of nightshade, which is kind of an interesting plant um, because it's both can be um, can be eaten, but is also kind of a dangerous plant as well. Um, and then her third paper was on tobacco, and that's what this is an SEM uh, photograph of. She's trying to get down to the specific species um, that was found at the site. And you'll notice that tobacco was only found with Oneota, um, as well as the fruits. And for fruits, that's one of the things Oneota everywhere. Um, they do a very wide kind of um, diverse um, intensification gathering. Um, they use everything. They really like their fruits. <laughs> and so um, that's happening here as well. Uh, Jeffrey Painter will be defending his dissertation on Monday, um, which I'm very much looking forward to. Um, it's a very nice dissertation on ceramic wear analysis, sort of more of a cuisine approach, taking those, um, those foodstuffs and turning them into what we eat culturally that can be very different. Same ingredients, totally different dishes. And um, so he's come up with some interesting um, results from that, which I'm not gonna steal his thunder. And I'm sure he'll come out with a couple of articles um, right away. But he's looking at both that and then how people use, um, use the dishes, the broad rim plates, um, which are pictured over on the right. Um, the Oneota adopt that form when they come um, to Morton Village, but they don't use them in the same way um, as the Mississippians do. So that's kind of interesting as well. Okay, here are our publications to date. Um, you'll notice that most of these um, kind of harken back to uh, the cemetery. <coughs> Excuse me. So our first. Our first round, you know, after um, some of the field work um, had gone on, we were beginning to get these pictures of uh, that were in the village that were quite different from what the cemetery was offering. And so um, some of us were involved in sort of reconceptualizing what some of that information from the cemetery, um, how that might be interpreted. Um, so some of that is that there's some food ways publications that have come out um, as well. Um, yeah, I think that about covers that. And then the works in preparation. Um, Mike Connor and I are just finishing up, putting the finishing touches on an article on coalescence and hybridity at Morton Village, um, which will serve as kind of the base article um, for a lot of what's coming out. Um, Jeffrey Painter's dissertation, which I already mentioned. Um, Autumn Painter, who you're going to hear from this afternoon, um, is looking at the faunal uh, remains. Um, and let's see, the last one, oh, on space uh, by Nikki Claremont. Um, so those are all things that are, are in the works. And after all of that, hopefully an edited volume. And from there, who knows? And that's all I have. <laughs>